I still remember the sound of the machines going off, our family sobbing, and the doctors calmly yet authoritatively telling the nurses what to do with her body. Can I ask you all some questions? How many of you love the way you look? How many of you wish you could be in a little bit better shape? How many of you have ever written a book? How many of you have always wanted to share your story? How many of you have started a company? And how many of you know what those dark days are like in the moment you're clinging to that vision? How many of you love your family? But how many of you have told them why lately? How many of you are here with your significant other? and have made the time to tell them why you picked them out of everybody else you could have been with. We're going to parking lot all of that. You see, I was born with a life-threatening genetic condition known as cystic fibrosis. It has destroyed my pancreas and requires 38 pills a day just to digest my food which now has caused a rare form of diabetes that I manage up to five times a day with insulin. In addition, last year I spent over 120 days in the hospital on IV antibiotics accessed through this port, which I surgically had to have implanted into my chest for immediate vein access. I was hospitalized on October 31st, and I actually got out of the hospital one day before alchemy. So a lot of you have probably seen me walking around carrying a pink bag, which is full of all of my IVs, which I've been infusing every three hours during this conference. All of this is an attempt to destroy the latest bacteria that wants to destroy all of my future opportunities. So we're going to go back to January 2017 for a typical night in the hospital for a lifer like me, which, by the way, lifer is hospital lingo for the types of patients that routinely check in and out of the hospital multiple times a year until they die. <sighs> this is the third time. In 20 minutes, my IV pole beeps, alerting me that there is air in the lines of the tubes connected to my port. I glance at the clock. 2.32 a.m. You would think that hospitals are a place to rest, relax, recover, sleep in. No, they're not. Because during the day, there's a host of staff members walking into and out of your room giving you treatments. And at night, there's a host of different staff members walking back into and out of your room to test how those treatments are responding in your body. In the past 12 hours, I've consumed 38 pills, 12 nebulizer treatments, five different insulin shots, and a continuous drip of IV antibiotics, all in an attempt to help me breathe so I don't get hospitalized again in two more months. And I, <laughs> I know, I just have to hit that little button, page the nurse, and she'll come back in and she'll just fix my IV pool for me. But the thing is, it's 2.32 a.m. And we would probably spend the next three hours chatting about everything that's happened in the two months since I've seen her last. So I flick back my covers, walk over to my own IV pole, silence the mind-numbingly loud machine, and I gently flick the air bubbles back up the pole to the tube where they belong. I glance around, and I really relish in my thankfulness to have such vitality after being told for 29 years that next year might not happen. I have my blanket on the bed, my lucky teddy bear to keep me company. I have my work laptop charging in the corner next to a stack of my newly published books that the doctors asked me to autograph. And on the shelf, on the shelf are two dozen roses that the love of my life dropped off yesterday to serve as a reminder that all I really need to focus on while I'm here is outliving them. And I've learned it doesn't matter if you're running a team, a company, 
or an IV drip bag. When you love your life, and the people and things you choose to fill it with. You will quit capitalizing on only the good stuff because the bad stuff is still a reminder that there is air in your lungs. For the most part, silent. And I've really come to love the silence of nights in the hospitals, except for those random code blues, which in a twisted way also makes me relish in my thankfulness that my cheeks still have that rosy pink color to them. I decide to unhook myself from the pole and go for a walk. Because one thing I love about living in the hospital more than my own homes is that eerie peacefulness that 3 a.m. can bring. Although it's unusually warm, I decide I still want to put on a sweater because one thing I have learned is it's important to always focus on the vision you have of yourself. And when the situation's very bleak, I choose to look like a visitor so I know I'm going home instead of looking like a patient. And as I walk out of my room, I open the doorway, and I check to make sure the nurses aren't at their stations. They hate it when I wander off. And uh, peek, the corridor's fine. I sneak off into the corridor that the security guard showed me a few months ago. And as I do, I walk past room 211. A friend of mine's staying there. She's such a cute girl. <laughs> she has wispy blonde hair, and she coughs every time she laughs, which is hilarious, because then it makes me laugh, and then I start coughing, and the two of us just, we sound disgusting, but it's hilarious and funny, and it's everything perfect about being in that moment. And last night, so the thing about cystic fibrosis, for those of you who may not know, is we're not allowed to really come into contact with each other because she could have a bacteria that could kill me and vice versa. So I always stand just kind of in her doorway and we talk and she's way too sick to get up. Her, she's a lot more critical than me. Her family asks that I keep her anonymous. And uh, she's got her oxygen mask and we start talking about Nelson Mandela, right? Like, is what we go through at all relatable to him? Like, did he look forward to the pre-planned bad food? because it was just a time for human interaction and food? Did he focus on everything he could do inside his four by four instead of the lives of those he loved that pressed on without his existence? Did he choose to think about everything he could control and everything he could do and every memory he could have rather than wonder about the memories that he would never have? As I reflect on our conversation, I decide to set my phone alarm to go off at 3.30 a.m. so I'm back by my next round of IVs. And as I do, I realize I missed a text from my boyfriend. Hey, baby, I miss you. It's hard to sleep without you here. I know, I know he wonders if this is the hospitalization where I leave through the morgue instead of the entrance. I was diagnosed with a pretty nasty infection that there's not a lot of treatments for. And he himself admits it's really tough on him. But the thing is, is I, I know what to share with him. And I know what not to share with him. Because reassuring a sobbing loved one that they won't have to bury me soon is a speech that I have practiced over and over while ho walking hospital hallways my entire life. And we've all seen that quote, that entrepreneurship is believing in a vision that nobody can see but you. I know my body's PNL statement is pretty weak. I know what's forecasted for my longevity is definitely not impressive. But I also know the vision and the dedication and the power I have to take myself from a wheelchair with an oxygen mask to being able to run again is the same vision I have to take my company from something that's kind of small to on the Inc. 500. And I know how to reassure this to him as well. Same way I reassure my employees during a hospitalization that they're not gonna wake up one day wondering if they have a job but how many jobs they'll have to do. You know, I've spent so, so many nights of my life <clears throat> reassuring dying friends to just keep fighting. 
that this isn't their time, that they can do it. But we all knew it was a promise that would just not uphold because we all knew they'd take their last breath soon. As a kid, I was very, very involved in socializing with other people with cystic fibrosis until one by one, they died off. And I've lost more friends to this disease than I care to count. I was about 10, 12 years old, and I was in a hospital, and another tune-up, and I met Jake. Jake was about six or seven years old, and uh, at the time at the University of Iowa hospitals and clinics, it was common practice for us all to go downstairs to the gym for our daily workouts. And Jake was always on the treadmill facing me. So, Jake, me. And we'd have these competitions. Like, let's see who can run as fast as we can until we cough, and that's how we'll know who wins. And it was just kind of a way that we enjoyed having our 2 p.m. daily workouts. We could cough up the mucus that was going to kill us. And one day Jake showed up wearing the oxygen mask. And in between his own choking on mucus, he said to me, one day, I'm going to run like you can. Jake was put on a ventilator that evening and died that weekend. And it made me think, why do we wait to cherish those whom we love until after they die? Seems like every seminar I go to, there's always some guru who will tell us, we should write our eulogy. We should write our epitaph. And for about 10 minutes, I feel inspired, and I think, yeah, that's a really good idea. But then I go home, and I never do it. But that's what walking the halls of a hospital every couple months at 3 a.m. can do for you. It'll give you the chance to practice what you would really say to your loved ones if you knew you wouldn't wake up tomorrow.